everyone. Welcome to today's session. We are continuing to look at Adam Miller's play, All My Sons. And uh, we stopped at a certain point uh, last week in the discussion where we realized that more things are being revealed into this uh, plot line. And we realized that there is much more than the unspeakability of death. There are it's a lot of baggage, there are a lot of secrets which uh, the family is uncomfortable about. And those are the kind of secrets which has larger implications for the society, for the nation as well. So here we take a uh, detour and try to take a look at some of the major themes that this play is exploring. Um, so in a, in a very significant way, at a central level, the play explores the American dream and the various facets of it. So we find that all of these characters, they are uh, trying to achieve something or the other in, in slightly in, in different ways, perhaps. Whether we look at a character like Joe Keller, who is a thriving industrialist in this case, who's a self-made man who ha can uh, you know, tell a story which is like from rags to riches. Or we are looking at a character like Jim, who is a doctor, who is uh, thriving in his profession, but also you know, due to his uh, the, the compulsions of his idealism, he would also want to get into some medical research. So we find that there are these different kinds of characters who have placed the American dream uh, at the center of their life in uh, in different ways and their trajectories are also very different in that sense and there's also Chris uh, who is an idealist to the core perhaps you know the most idealist figure in this entire play there's also Chris who cannot quite digest the fact that things could be done you know a certain uh, uh, you know things could be uh, done or things could be acceptable even emotionally or morally if it is done just for the family. So uh, for a person like Chris, the concern is that of uh, the larger society, which is where, you know, uh, the title All My Sons also comes from. And this is a concern. We're not entirely sure whether all the characters in the play really share this uh, attitude, this belief that Chris has in mind that, uh, you know, the entire uh, society, the entire nation needs to be seen as an extension of the family. We are not very sure whether all characters uphold that view, but we find that that is also a major, that becomes a major uh, dividing line in terms of, you know, trying to understand uh, what is legitimate, what is not legitimate, what is acceptable morally, what is not acceptable, yeah, etc. Yeah. So secondly, this is about the crisis of post-war society. We find this getting explored in so many ways in the play. And we also find these different characters having different uh, defense mechanisms to deal with the post-war crisis. The post-war crisis operates in a very different way in the American society. Uh, the casualty is elsewhere. They all have lost their family members, particularly the male members, the male members of the family uh, in different parts of the world. The casualty, the site of casualty is elsewhere. And there is always this longing. There is always this endless wait uh, for uh, the uh, their, their sons to return home and the newspaper is also full of such stories we get to uh, realize. So the crisis in the post-war period operates in a slightly different way than that uh, you know we see it operating in say uh, Britain or any of the other uh, European countries. And uh, here you know if we take a look at a couple of characters like Larry who has gone missing or Annie uh, who tries to move on, uh, you know, uh, to, tries to pick up her life and continue to move on. Or Chris, who would also ideally want to move on, but she is also torn with these, uh, uh, between his family responsibilities and uh, what he owes to Annie. Yeah, so we find these characters torn in different ways, largely due to the crisis that the post-war period has placed on them. So uh, a lot of things that the nation decides, the nation decides to pursue in terms of its uh, territorial ambitions, in terms of its, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the kind of uh, relations uh, that it has in the international scenario that also has a very direct implication on particular families, though the site per se, those cities per se are not war sites. Yeah. So responsibility and morality, these two aspects are seen uh, in most of the cases in this play, pulling in different directions. The what is moral may not always end up being the most responsible thing for the family. Like if we take these two characters, Steve and Joe, uh, the Keller family and the um, Annie's family, we find that um, they, the, both these father figures, they both have committed 
something which is entirely unacceptable in moral ways, entirely unacceptable in terms of the interests of the nation, in terms of the interests of the larger society. But they, they are also, you know, trying to uh, place themselves as fathers. They are also trying to place themselves as, uh, uh, you know, responsible family figures in an attempt to, uh, a failed attempt uh, to, in an attempt to, um, uh, you know, get out of the feeling of guilt. Yeah. So this also brings us to the final theme over here in terms of the diverse pools of guilt and atonement. Uh, the uh, the critics are of different opinion whether uh, towards the end of the play whether uh, Joe Keller actually receives his atonement or not. Uh, there is a deep-seated sense of guilt. There is a deep-seated sense of guilt which manifests in many different ways. Uh, in the case of Steve, you know, who's in prison, it also comes out as anger because he also feels uh, that he's been betrayed. So the sense of guilt, the feeling of betrayal, the, the, the acts of atonement, they are all getting played out in different ways. There is no, absolutely no way in which we could say which is the right format of uh, the journey of the guilt and atonement over here. So uh, critics are of diverse opinion of whether Joe Keller receives his uh, atonement or not by the end of the play. And there are also a number of uh, critics who are of the opinion that just because he's guilty enough to take his life does not mean that he has... Uh, uh, been uh, held responsible in the right legal way. So uh, this is in that sense, there is a closure, but it's also an open-endedness, which makes this play uh, endlessly fascinating to approach in different ways. In all of these aspects, we find that the kind of memories that particular characters uh, choose to linger on to, it also has a bearing on the kind of decisions that they take, the kind of uh, trajectories that their uh, lives uh, uh, you know, are, are taking them through. So, um, so now when we are trying to analyze the first aspect of this, the American dream, uh, we uh, already have uh, you know, very briefly discussed this. This is the American dream is the notion that uh, you know, it's a dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for every man with opportunity for each according to his ability for achievement. So this is uh, you know, some kind of a, uh, uh, a reach towards success, towards prosperity through sheer hard work, regardless of where they are placed in terms of their class, where they are placed in terms of their uh, ethnicity, in terms of their uh, uh, you know, claim to any sort of uh, uh, um, uh, claim to any kind of, you know, ancestral uh, achievements. So this is uh, ultimately about equality, freedom, and an opportunity for upward mobility. Uh, but plays like this, and there are other playwrights too, who had uh, aimed to criticize the notion of American dream, like John Steinbeck, uh, <clears throat> Scott Fitz Fitzgerald, Tennessee Williams. So they are uh, all trying to argue through their play that it's an unrealistic and unattainable quest. So that becomes entirely evident in the way we are looking at the specific characters and how things get played out in their lives. Yeah, So all of them are in this quest, which is unrealistic, which is unattainable in some form or the other. We find that even in the minor characters, such as Jim, who is in some sense, his family thinks that, you know, he's doing well, he is thriving uh, to, uh, in, in his medical practice, but he is also, you know, he has this quest to go for something slightly different. He wants to go into, uh, he wants to uh, get into medical research, which his family thinks will not be good for them in the long run. So we find these characters being placed in different uh, uh, stages of their lives, trying to negotiate with the reality around them, but all the more, you know, believing in the American dream in some form or the other. And this belief also becomes uh, the central problematic over here for a character like uh, Kate, the mother, who is waiting for her son to come back uh, you know, though deep within perhaps she also knows that he is not going to come back. But that faith in the possibility of the sun coming back, that's also something generated by the American dream. The newspapers are full of this promise and hope, which is not necessarily uh, helping them move forward, but it's also pulling them backward, not allowing them to uh, uh, you know, get rid of their past in some form. Um, so here in this play, we find that Miller is critiquing 
the American dream in two major ways. One, arguing that it is not a real success. Um, so here, the, the, uh, in the play, the embodiment of uh, American dream is perhaps the character, the central protagonist, Joe Keller. And uh, we find that, you know, superficially, when we look at him, he's a very successful man. He's a self-made man. And he also, you know, we gather um, in the course of the play that he went to night school, that he had worked really hard to reach where he has. And he has a very good uh, family, a very good and excellent support system. He uh, seems to have, you know, um, gained enough wealth. Uh, there is this uh, instance where he says now he has got enough money to make sure that, you know, there's a maid to take care of his wife's needs, but the wife does not let the maid uh, do everything. So we find that there is a certain uh, way in which the family seems to have reached a very comfortable level of living. And they also have achieved uh, enough social recognition, rep their reputation is good enough. Of course, you know, there is a doubt. I mean, we, we uh, wonder in between, especially when Annie visits and when Annie and Sue are having this conversation, we wonder whether the neighborhood is still talking about them. But the point is, uh, the uh, even Sue, who seems to have a lot of discontentment against uh, Chris, she also realizes that the Kellers were always the kind of family for whom everyone wanted to do things. Yeah, And no one speaks ill of them to their face. And uh, uh, we, we find that that tells us a lot about the kind of social standing that the family has uh, in the neighborhood. And he's also you know, quite well known in his circles and uh, he's quite um, well respected as well. But uh, there's a flip side to it. The ending of the play, presumably now you have, you know, uh, you must have read the entire play by now. So uh, towards the end of the play, we realize that this is all very superficial. He is, he has never been truly happy. And he's just been ignoring things and avoiding things and avoiding a direct confrontation about anything. And he's been trying to live in this make-believe world. And in the end, it's his guilt which forces him to commit suicide. There's a gunshot at the background towards the end of the play and we know that he has taken his life and it is not a momentary guilt. It's not a momentary consumption of uh, guilt. It's something which had been growing, yeah? which is why he has always been avoiding all the uncomfortable discussions around what happened in the past. So um, Miller in some form in this play is showing that the American dream mm, I know the way in which success is measured, happiness is measured in the context of the American dream, it is uh, not entirely right. The yardsticks are perhaps not entirely right. A lot of things are perhaps misplaced in, uh, in, in various ways, you know, in a very uncanny way, in a very uh, ironic way, we find that, you know, the Annie's family, Annie, George and uh, Father Steve, yeah, uh, they seem to be a bit more in sync as a family towards the end of the play than Joe Keller's family, which is clearly disintegrating towards the end. Yeah, Larry had already, uh, you know, died and we realized towards the end of the play that, you know, through the letter that Annie is revealing that Larry died as a man, as a son, you know, feeling uh, extremely ashamed of what his father had done, uh, you know, uh, with the sense of betrayal that he had faced from his father, who was otherwise his hero figure. And we also find that, you know, Chris also loses his respect for um, Joe Keller, you know, this man whom he thinks he always thought, you know, was the epitome of success and integrity. And he was partly ashamed of the money, but he also also had this sense of realization that uh, Joe Keller ha was never, you know, wrong in anything. So this, uh, uh, these yardsticks of measuring success, measuring happiness, measuring integrity, they all seem to be misplaced in this context of the American dream. Uh, because economic mobility, uh, the upward mobility, the uh, reputation, all these things uh, uh, seem to be accentuated much more than it should in terms of uh, analyzing success, in terms of evaluating the happiness quotient. So that gets exposed very clearly, not just in All My Sons, but also in uh, the uh, Death of a Salesman, as we had very clearly seen before. And um, uh, secondly, the problem with the American dream as uh, All My Sons and other similar plays foregrounded, it has the ability to corrupt people. Yeah. So Joe Keller, uh, he, we find that you know he is a man who had to compromise on his integrity uh, and his sense of morality in his pursuit of uh, material success. This happens very inadvertently. We also know that you know at that point when the police raid and other things were happening about the uh, the flawed cylinders, the broken uh, uh, you know uh, cylinders which had to go into those aircrafts. Yeah, he was 
largely trying to protect himself and his family. And which is why there was never an intention for him to deliberately put anyone else's life at risk. But in the, in, in, uh, while, you know, weighing and fixing his priorities, we realize that, you know, he ends up making a lot of uh, uh, terrible choices. With this deep-seated belief that with wealth and status, uh, much could be preserved in terms of you know, family peace, in terms of the family, the close-knit feeling. We find that Joe Keller is entirely wrong, though he uh, fails to realize it till the end of his uh, life. Um, so uh, he is also, you know, whether we like to see it that way or not, he also, you know, becomes the this embodiment of the kind of person who is willing to risk the lives of many people and uh, who's willing to even betray his own nation while he is, you know, again, ironically pursuing this uh, American dream. So there is a lot of, you know, selfish interests at stake over here while one is also pursuing this dream. And this is the irony which uh, uh, Adam Miller's play, All My Sons, is in some form trying to foreground by placing the nation's interests, larger societal interests, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the interests of the family, interests of, uh, you know, uh, a father who is trying to protect his family, who is trying to uh, you know, provide for his family. So this is a dichotomy which is uh, uh, which is seen as very ambivalent for a man like Joe Keller, but for someone like Chris, it seems to be very clear. Which is why you know, halfway through the play, Joe Keller points out that Larry uh, never f flew a P forty. Uh, he immediately intervenes and asks, "So who flew the other uh, planes?" Yeah. Uh, picks, yeah. So it is human lives, whether you know it's a son in this family or any other family, it's all human lives, and which is why you know again uh, the title of the play becomes very significant. It's all my sons, yeah. So, um, the, the crisis of the post war society, and as mentioned, the effect of the war can be seen in every character. And uh, uh, when we are looking at particular characters, Chris, uh, he, uh, he, he also uh, went out. Uh, you know, he was also part of the war. Uh, he comes back alive, of course. And he also talks about how he enjoyed those, uh, you know, friendships and the brief relationships that he forged during, uh, in, in the war camps. And uh, he is also burdened with this survivor's guilt. Uh, and and, and, and in two different ways, he is burdened with this guilt. One, you know, within his family, he is the only survivor. Like uh, to, in, in the beginning when uh, Joe Keller talks about this tally, the war has in, in so many ways disturbed this tally. He had two sons, now he has only one. And the uh, one who is the, the son who is alive now, Chris, he in, 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 in some way, you know, he's also made to feel guilty, though in very in inadvertent ways, particularly, you know, it becomes... Uh, uh, the, the trigger is when Annie visits and when Chris declares that he would like to go and, uh, you know, go ahead and get married to Annie, who earlier was Larry's girl. Yeah, so uh, we, we find that he's uh, uh, unable to make peace at that level at home. And also later when he comes to realize that his father and uh, his business partner, Joe Keller and his partner Steve, were actually involved in uh, the... Uh, you know, selling and shipping the flawed cylinders for the aircraft, yeah, that also places him in a very difficult situation. So he becomes, uh, you know, a survivor who is burdened with guilt in many ways. He becomes a survivor. He had served the country, uh, but uh, he also realizes that he's placed in a very precarious position where he also, uh, though not directly, had betrayed. He was part of that business too, and and uh, and and though you know he was occasionally ashamed of the money, uh, ashamed of the rat race, but still, uh, he technically was being fed. You know, all his comforts had come from that money, which Joe Keller made, yeah, by betraying the nation too. So, um, in and in, in such ways, we find that the effect of the war is, uh, in and perhaps you know more on him, though he is also a survivor. And Joe Keller, he is someone who prospered through the war. Yeah. So. The, Again, you know, it's very ironically placed over here. War does not necessarily become something which always uh, destroys people. Here, there is a possibility. The American dream, the capitalist society, also opens up this possibility for people to thrive because of war, to achieve material prosperity because of war. Yeah. So he becomes a, a victim of war towards the end when you know when he's consumed by guilt and he decides to take his own life because he realizes that you know he's guilty for the death of uh, uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, those uh, 21 young 
men who flew that flawed aircraft, the damaged aircraft, but he realizes that inadvertently he was responsible for his own son's death because the son could not take the kind of betrayal uh, that he faced. Yeah? So uh, here, you know, the prosperity that war brings in and the flip side of it, the money that war brings in in spite of the terrible things that it leaves behind, that's also something that this uh, play is uh, trying to uh, foreground as well as critique. So Kate and Annie are uh, uh, two uh, women who lost their loved ones due to war. One lost, you know, uh, Larry. Uh, uh, both of them lost Larry for, uh, you know, um, Annie loses her lover and Kate loses her son. So for them, their life is forever fixated in these losses and trying to move away from these losses. And they are also, you know, these as women, they're also required in uh, while they are also grieving, they are also, you know, they have this additional responsibility which they themselves place on them to protect their family. So only towards, you know, uh, a little more than halfway through the play, uh, more centrally only in the third act, we realize that Kate is actually not preserving herself. Her, uh, the uh, inability, her unwillingness to accept her son's death is largely to protect the family, to protect uh, her husband from that feeling of guilt. Because if Larry's death is uh, uh, proven, it means that Joe Keller was also responsible for that. Yeah. So we find that these women are trying to do multiple things at the same time, dealing with their own griefs, but also trying to protect their family. And Annie has a more uh, problematic background. Her father is in prison and uh, she's not been talking to uh, her father, thinking that he is guilty. And towards the end, she also realizes that uh, it's not her father who's guilty, but the man whom she had been idolizing. But the man, uh, because of him, uh, you know, Larry uh, lost his life, a man because of him, uh, because of whom, you know, uh, Chris is uh, getting estranged. Yeah. So um, uh, it's a very complicated scenario in terms of the post-war uh, surviving, though the characters are not directly involved with war, though the characters are not directly present in any of the sites of war, which is why, you know, the American post-war narratives becomes more, they become more interesting and more intriguing than they are perhaps, you know, in the other, and in, in the rest of the world. So, and George Deaver is someone who lost uh, his uh, father's reputation uh, in, because Steve Deaver is in uh, jail and George has not been able to move uh, on with his life after that and Lydia, Lydia gets married and she also has three kids when we meet her. So we find that, you know, he left for war and then uh, he could never resume this relationship with Lydia, which he majorly regrets when he finds that, you know, his life had not really moved on much after these various crises which had befallen him. So it's personal, it's uh, fa familial. It's also about, you know, uh, the family suffered a major reputation crisis too. So it is multifaceted in terms of the crisis that they are trying to go through, some of which they can overcome and most of which they cannot. It seems to be like you know, a permanent damage has been done you know, when we uh, look at some of the characters such as uh, George Deva. So uh, here, you know, the participants of the war, we realize we're not just the soldiers. We're not just the ones who went out to war, not just the ones who I know, came back or did not come back. It is uh, a very deep-seated problem that eats into the individuals, the families, the ones that surround them. And also, you know, it becomes a national crisis in that sense. Uh, so even after the end of the war, even after war becomes just a national memory, we find these characters being unable to move on with. And even, uh, you know, as uh, mentioned before, the stories of people coming back from uh, uh, you know, after getting lost in the war, even those stories are, uh, it's very morbid in a sense that not allowing the family to move on. And uh, so when we look at the, uh, the, the aspect of responsibility and morality, so we find that their sense of, you know, the individual sense of responsibility, morality, they all get mixed up in this, uh, uh, because there's a mixing up, there's a clear mixing up of priorities also over there. And uh, there's also a very pra practical, pragmatic side to it. There's a high rate of inflation. There's a high rate of poverty. The 1930s were a huge blow on the American economy. So at some level, these families, they're also trying to recover from that. So Joe Keller in, is also an individual who's trying to stay afloat during this crisis. So uh, at that point, the priorities uh, clearly shift towards keeping his family safe, f uh, providing for his family. One cannot entirely blame him for taking that attitude either, because if the 
uh, damaged cylinders, if the incident of the damaged cylinders and the following crisis and the, uh, uh, you know, the tragedy of, you know, losing 21 uh, young men, if that had not happened, uh, we wouldn't have found anything, you know, going wrong in Joe Keller's uh, family. So it's, it's a very uh, difficult moral position, uh, which also makes it difficult for us to judge it in any form. So uh, one cannot entirely blame a character like Joe Keller for feeling that, you know, as long as he's taking care of his family, everything is fine because uh, each one had to fend for themselves, particularly after the 1930s crisis in terms of, you know, getting out of the, uh, in terms of getting out of that crisis the economic crisis, which really had, you know, taken a toll on uh, individuals as well as a nation. So, which is why a character like Joe is forced to justify his reason towards the end, saying he was fulfilling his duty by being a good father, by earning for his family, by providing for his family, by protecting his uh, family. Um, Chris's idealism, yeah, Chris's idealism is found um, uh, perhaps, you know, not practical, not feasible, not just within his family, even Sue, the, uh, the, the neighbor's family, even Sue finds that, you know, uh, his idealism could perhaps affect families in the long run, because that's not how things work when your priorities shift towards taking care of your family. So it's a very problematic uh, sense of responsibility and morality that this play is trying to explore through. So um, this, uh, and, and also in terms of, uh, a man's particularly, you know, it, it's also seen as a very male thing, yeah. In terms of defining a man's value and his sense of responsibility, it's also equated with the kind of financial security that he, he can provide. And it is not just in Keller's family. We find that, you know, when Sue is uh, having this brief conversation with Annie, she also talks about that in terms of, you know, how one should always look for uh, financial security. Uh, before one gets married because that is a very clear foundation on which a lot of other emotional things also rest yeah so we do find a shifting sense of responsibility a shifting sense of morality uh, uh, due to various reasons it's a post-war period it's the post uh, depression uh, period economic depression period and it is also this uh, 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 you know this chase this uh, mad rush towards pursuing the American dream. In Joe Keller's life, yeah, which could be an extreme case portrayed here as well, what happens is once he's shifting, when he's gravitating um, mostly towards fulfilling his responsibilities as a father, as a family person, he, it, it, it comes to, you know, in a very shocking way, it's also revealed that he's willing to betray his business partner, his uh, customers, his nation. And it also leads to this major tragedy, which he's trying to uh, ignore which you know that's where the central problematic lies you know all had this while he had known that this had was a problem that his decision or his lack of decision had caused this uh, the tragic death of 21 young men and still he is uh, uh, you know able to take refuge in the fact that he was providing for his family that he was protecting his family that is a central problematic that uh, other miller in this play is trying to explore as well as very very severely critique which is why perhaps such an extreme instance had to be placed at the center of this story which is why perhaps you know a, a, a character of uh, such extreme natures and such extreme decisions had to be made the protagonist as well so while uh, Mil miller here is actually not pointing fault uh you know uh, uh, pointing fingers at particular individuals and blaming them or trying to judge them but he's trying to critique the value system over here the misplaced value system over here where there is a possibility of certain kinds of things getting legitimized certain kinds of things getting overlooked because uh, you know the american dream has mixed up uh, so many things the value system the priorities the economic uh, uh, social uh, you know pursuits yeah and the moral obligation towards other human beings it seems to be the least preferred item in this uh, in, the, in this journey in this trajectory in this pursuit towards uh, uh, you know the american dream yeah so um we come to the final um, uh, bit where uh, you know the, the play is also centrally about guilt and atonement you know that's how it ends about uh, the you know different characters coming to terms with 
realities and taking responsibility even if that means bringing their own life to death whether that is a good way of taking responsibility whether that's a good legitimate closure or not that's a different thing that we will not debate at the moment but guilt is certainly a recurring theme in the play even a character like chris who remains quite blissfully unaware of the realities until i uh, you know he is exposed to a lot of uncomfortable truths unpleasant tragic truths we find that even he feels uh, a sense of guilt a uh, sense of embarrassment about the money which is coming to him about being a uh, you know partaking in that fortune that his father is making there is an unspoken uh, you know sense of guilt in his uh, uh, dealings the guilt of being a survivor the guilt of not being able to do enough either for his family or uh, towards any so it is uh, uh, guilt seems to be a very recurring theme in so many ways over here so even before uh, uh, if you're looking at uh, joe keller's character who's also the protagonist in many ways uh, it's interesting to explore this question whether i you know he was always guilty from the beginning did he always knew you know did he always feel this guilty even before the truth about larry uh, was exposed so um uh, may, maybe you know i uh, in this if you do a close reading of the play it's possible to argue that his guilt and his attempts for atonement they are foreshadowed several times in the play in several instances yeah in those uh, seemingly childish games that he plays with uh, the the children and in his uh, the way in which he is dealing with his you know, wife uh, with his son and also you know when he is reminiscing about the past there's a selective kind of memory which is at work and more importantly maybe one of the telling scenes is where you know he uh, in in an attempt to justify annie's father uh he keeps saying a father is a father yeah it's in some sense you know he's trying to um uh, get himself uh, it is his guilt feeling that you know he is trying to salvage over here it's an uh, it's, it's a very uh there's a very inherent uh, sense of guilt and the unconscious way in which he is trying to seek atonement for that um so his suspicion of any Uh, it's also a projection of his guilt here yeah? the uh, because there is this secret there is this constant fear of the secret being revealed so the moment the family gets to know that uh george is visiting his father uh, steve diva uh this uh, you know the sense of fear the sense of anxiety yeah and suspicion everything comes up so it's at this point that we realize that you know in fact kate's uh, uh suspicion anxiety everything is an extension of what joe had gone through as well um so which is why you know it's maybe you know it's again because of the guilt that you know joe also wants to offer a place or he he keeps saying that you know he tries to play this big man over here he tries to become this very benevolent industrialist over here by saying the moment um steve diva comes back from jail you know there's a place here waiting for him yeah so it is actually you know he's trying to make atonement uh, for his betrayal through these different ways and his lack of stance you know he uh fails to take a stance either with chris or with his wife kate that also reflects this uh, fluid nature of his uh, uh temperament also uh reflects the sense of guilt and the sense of atonement that he is trying to seek so and kate incidentally comes across as this character who knew everything from the beginning though you know she comes across uh, in, in the first half of the play as someone who is trying to run after a lot of irrational things like you know horoscopes and a memorial tree yeah we find that she is perhaps the one character who knew what exactly was happening and he is aware of her husband's guilt of course you know she did not know the truth about larry's uh, uh, death for sure and he uh her attempt to keep her son alive in her mind as well as in her family is also you know he's she's actually trying to protect her uh, husband yeah from being consumed by this uh, idea that um, uh, you know he was a murderer of uh, their son um so uh the the kind of denial the superstitious beliefs that kate has is an extension of this knowledge this knowledge uh, that uh, you know this uh, that her husband had actually you know to inadvertently murder their son um so 
uh, while Joe's decision to kill himself is perhaps a tangible a marker of how he wants to seek atonement, yeah. Uh, as many critics have also pointed out, one is not very sure whether that really makes up to what he had done before, the, 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 the way in which he had wronged perhaps, you know, his business partner, the way in which he had wronged his family, his son, all the other, you know, the 21 young men and their families and by extension the nation. So whether this is an escapist thing that he does since he cannot live with it anymore because that is the moment when he massively gets exposed, yeah, he finds that, you know, he cannot find refuge anymore in the fact that, you know, he was actually trying to do this to protect his family because his family is not with him anymore at that point. And he has to take this decision to end his misery. And again, you know, it could be seen as a very, very selfish decision as well. So uh, La Larry uh, takes his life, you know, uh, uh, Larry is the first man who commits suicide over here. And he is also able to, unable to live with this guilt of, uh, uh, you know, the, the knowledge of the corruption that his father had committed. Yeah. So it's a, uh, there is a kind of an escapism too, uh, which is allied with this feeling of guilt. Yeah. The men over here, uh, both men, in fact, you know, Though they commit suicide for various reasons, Larry as well as uh, um, uh, Larry as well as Joe Keller, uh, we find that they are unable to take responsibility in the real sense of the term. Yeah, so at uh, we we find that uh, uh, in in that sense, you know, we are even forced to acknowledge that perhaps uh, Annie's father, you know, um, uh, the diva, the diva family, comes across as. Uh, perhaps more heroic in some form, you know, and uh, which is why towards the end of the play, they come together as a family. They appear at least, you know, a bit more closer than they were before. There's no more disintegration, but the Keller family entirely disintegrates, yeah. So in terms of the tally, we find that even the father is missing there. It's a post-war crisis. It is a post-war tragedy and war did not take their lives directly. But we find that, you know, in many indirect ways, in uh, uh, that the, the war had completely devastated their family. So uh, Miller in this uh, uh, play is trying to showcase, foreground the power of guilt and how you, the memory of a guilty past can completely uh, destroy one's uh, present as well as future. That is what we find happening to every single character over here, particularly in Keller's family where the memory of what had happened is stronger than what actually had happened to yeah so this denial the misplaced belief in these uh, uh, different systems the mixed up priorities it's all part of the flawed memories yeah the incomplete memories that each one is carrying maybe you know we cannot even call them as flawed memories that's a kind of memory that cho they, they choose to have yeah and chris uh, we do not know you know how chris is going to uh, continue with his life because uh, he uh, perhaps uh, you know now he blames himself for um, multiple deaths yeah and unlike harry however you know the the uh, perhaps he is more courageous and he decides to continue with his life. He decides to lead a good life uh, in, in a very ideal form, perhaps, but not entirely consumed by the baggage that the other characters are affected with. Yeah. So um, you know, we will bring the discussion to a close now. And in the next session, we will take a one more close look at the final act and then see how some of the things are coming together in the final act and also take a look at how certain theatrical aspects are also uh, replicated in very telling ways in the uh, in, in this uh, play. So um, thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you again in the next session.